Uh, today we're going to be talking about the religions of the world a little bit. But actually this is just kind of an introduction to talking about my own journey of faith and how I got here and what maybe I learned along the way. So we're going to do that. But first of all, concerning the religions of the world, you know there are so many religions around the world. So many different faiths, literally hundreds and hundreds of different religious philosophies and philosophies that claim they're non-religious but have religious characteristics. And even people who say, oh, we're non-religious, they often do religious things. Or groups that say that, oh, no, we're, we don't believe in God at all. And then the next thing you know, they're turning around and they're worshiping something or somebody or even just a philosophical idea can become something that they're, they're bowing down to and giving their hearts to. Now what's going on with all this? Well, I think what we have to realize is that the human heart knows that there is something more than the life we have here. You know, we look around and life can be very good or it can be very hard, but whichever it is, somewhere down in the human heart we know there's more. There's something I'm not experiencing. I, I don't have it all. I'm not fully living up to uh, what it means to be human or to human potential. I'm not a completed human being yet. So we keep searching and we're looking. And probably all of these religious systems, you know, here we have, you know, Christianity, uh, Judaism, Taoism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, probably all of them contribute something useful to human society in some way. And yet, they conflict in what they teach. They conflict in the practices that they focus on. And we realize that truth also matters. It's not enough for a philosophy or religion to simply be somewhat useful to help you get through day-to-day -day life. That's not a bad thing if it helps you get through the day, but that's not enough. Or maybe it kind of holds your society and culture together by filling a role in that culture as a sort of a glue that binds people together. Well, that's okay, but that's not enough. If we want to fill our heart and experience that abundant life, we have to have truth. We have to know what's real and what's something that people just made up trying to satisfy themselves. And I don't claim to have all the answers, but I'm 60 years old and along the way I've tried and looked at different things and I think I've learned a couple of things. So I want to share a little bit about my own journey of faith and about what I think I've learned and maybe you can find something in there that's useful for you as well. Well, in terms of faith, my story starts out probably at St. Munchen's Catholic Church. Now if you don't know who St. Munchen is, this is a guy who founded the church in a place that's known as Limerick in Ireland. You know, at the time it was Luminaic, but it's Limerick now, and there's some jokes about Limericks. We don't need those at the moment, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe you've heard some. Uh, but he was the founder of the church there, and he became a Catholic saint for his work in Ireland. You know, and I was growing up on a farm in Missouri, you know, and we were growing tomatoes and feeding the cattle and riding the horses, you know, and harvesting the potatoes and all of these different things, you know, shucking the corn, you know, all this farm life, fishing and hunting, because that's very much part of the farm life in Missouri as well. And on Sunday mornings, mom would pack us up and she would take us to church. And, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, I would just kind of like fall asleep or hide under the pew and play or something, you know. But over the years went by, you know, I started getting interested in church things a little bit. And then we went to Catholic school. My brother and I, mom said, oh, you have to go to Catholic school. And they taught us many things. It was a very good school. The education level was very high. And they started taking us even more to church because it was right across the street from the church, the school there. And sometimes we would go in the morning before school started and things. And I began to see that there was a lot of, of sort of beauty in the ritual and the symbolism of the Catholic Mass. But as I was growing up, I had a sort of faith, but I think my faith was really not in God so much, but in the church. These people seem to know something, and the priests seem to be wise, and they seem to have all this history. And as a little kid, that really made an impression upon me. But I certainly wasn't a good Catholic, although I was a Catholic. I was baptized, I was confirmed, 
I even did a little thing, you know, they said altar boy at the time. They probably changed the term now where you come and you hold a little wine and you pour it for the priest and different things, you know, and stand behind the priest and help him in the service. So I was doing these things, and yet my life was somewhere else the rest of the week. And in, I don't know how familiar you are with Catholic practice, but they, they have in their churches what's called a confessional. And it's a little booth. This is not the one in, in my home church, but it's a, a little booth I found on the web. And um, you go in, the priest sits in the middle, and then people go in each side one at a time, but the, having doors on both sides allows it to go a little faster if there's a bunch of people waiting. And you go in and you tell the priest the things that you know you've done wrong, and there's a little curtain so he can't see your face. Of course, in a small town, he knows your voice anyway, so he knows it is. In a big city, he might not know who it is, but uh, you pretend you know he doesn't know who you are and that it's anonymous, and you confess your sins. And then he pronounces God's forgiveness of you and he gives you some prayers or things to do as a little exercise to try to remind you not to uh, commit these same sins again. Well, if you were think back to your childhood, you probably realized that every time uh, I went to confession, I was a little kid, a little boy, and I confessed pretty much the same laundry list of things every time. And it was kind of just a little ritual. But when I left, I always felt like something had happened, like I had been purified or cleansed by going through this. And then one time when I was 12 years old, I went in and I confessed my sins and I did the little prayers that we're supposed to do afterwards and things and I left the church and I walked out of the church and I realized I don't feel any different. It didn't work. I don't feel forgiven this time. I thought about what's wrong. Now, looking back now, I know what was wrong was the attitude in my heart was wrong. I'd come to an age where I really needed to know God and understand what was going on more, and I didn't, and I saw the problems in the church, and I was starting to be very cynical about the church and the things that were not so good in the church and the problems in the church, and my parents had gotten divorced, and uh, so my heart was really in the wrong place. But on that day, when I walked out and I didn't feel forgiven, in my heart, I left the Catholic Church. And I was back a few times, but it wasn't the same anymore because I no longer really had any confidence in what they were doing there. So I went on and I, uh, I joined the Marines when I was 17. You know, I had a busy year when I was 17. I, I got married, joined the Marines, had a child. Uh, that marriage, unfortunately, didn't work out very well. But in the Marines, after a bit, they sent me to Cherry Point, North Carolina after my initial training. And I was an aircraft electronics uh, repairman, avionics technician, they said. And I fixed the radar jammers on this aircraft. It was a radar jamming aircraft, EA-6A. And here it is flying over Marine Corps Air Station, Cherry Point, North Carolina. And I was stationed here for almost five years. But we would go on deployments. Now, while I was at Cherry Point, I met these people who were Buddhists, right? And they were partly an American group, partly Japanese, mostly Japanese uh, wives who had married American servicemen in Okinawa or in other parts of Japan and, and gone back. And they had a little Buddhist group and it would meet and they would do things. And I sort of had a Japanese girlfriend at the time. And she said, oh, you gotta go to these meetings. So I said, okay, I'll go. And I went to the meetings and I actually enjoyed them very much. They were very strange to me and yet they were enjoyable because there was food and there was sort of friendship and there was people talking and encouraging each other. And it was my first experience really with sort of a, a small group atmosphere. Uh, so we would go and we would do this ritual of chanting, you know, if you're familiar with it, it's actually a Soka Gakkai offshoot Nichiren Shoshu of America. And then after that, we would have a little teaching thing and then we would eat something and we would just talk and visit. And I got involved with it and it was kind of fun. and. I actually kind of liked it, you know, and I became a member and I became a Buddhist. So when I came to Japan in 1978 for the first time, I came as an American Buddhist to Japan, which gave me a very different experience of Japan maybe than most Americans visiting Japan have because I found I was welcomed into a lot of uh, groups, you know, the Soka Gakkai groups, even other Buddhist groups. They love to have me as a guest. And I was having a lot of fun, and I was on the aircraft carrier midway, and we would pull into port and have a couple weeks and go around uh, Yokosuka area and into Tokyo and things. 
And then I went on a pilgrimage, sort of, uh, they call it Tozan, to Taisekiji, which is the main temple of Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism, uh, if you know that history. I don't know if anyone does or not. And I had these big expectations about, I'm going to go to the main temple for this group that I've joined, and it's really going to be amazing, right? But I went, and I was very disappointed and felt very sort of disillusioned. And that's when I began to leave Buddhism. Because what I found instead of the atmosphere I expected, uh, I found that there was a lot of focus in just sort of shuffling people in and shuffling people out. They had long lines at the time and stuff. And there was actually a lot of focus on sort of money. Uh, <laughs> they didn't take up an offering, but you had to buy tickets to go in at the time, you know. And I got mine as a gift, but I could see the prices on the tickets. And the, some people have expensive tickets to go to the very front, you know, and get special ceremonies. And others were, you know, standing at the back, you know, and things. And then they had all these booths that were nearby selling all this books and paraphernalia associated with Buddhism. I started thinking, you know, this is very strange. This isn't at all what I experienced in the small group of this focus on, you know, basically money. And... I started to think about it, and that started to me reflect and started to ask a lot of questions. And I found that when I asked questions of the people in the groups and the leaders and things, they didn't have answers. You know, there was a practice, there was a, a great emphasis on world peace, you know, was a goal and this and that. But they didn't have any real answers about where do we come from, you know, how did this world become, what is the meaning really of life. and. Um, I wasn't very satisfied with the answers and I was a member for a couple of years still but I didn't really I, I lost the interest in it pretty quickly after that because it turned out to be a, a disappointment which the Catholic Church had been to me as well and that's when I sort of entered my sort of cynical phase of you know I thought you know I believed in God as a creator I still believed in God as a creator the whole time I was sort of a deist, if you've heard that term. And that means I believe in God and created everything, but I don't think he's really involved anymore. He's just kind of created everything, and he's up there watching to see what will happen to all of us and what we'll do. And uh, I thought all these people, all these religions, they're just people trying to figure out the answers and doing what they can, and none of them really know anything. That was kind of my position at the time uh, and how I felt about things. And so I became kind of cynical and kind of negative about religious things, and I would have said I was non-religious at the time. Uh, but I still sometimes, you know, visited a church or a temple or different things. Um, but it wasn't at all like I really believed in any of it anymore. Well, then in 1980, I came back to Japan again with the Marines, and this time I was stationed in Iwakuni in Yamaguchi Prefecture. Beautiful area if you get down there, you know, uh, go see the bridge and stuff. It's really pretty, you know. They got a really old historic bridge. Uh, but there's a lot of things down there. But one of the things I did, a friend and I went on a driving trip through Yamaguchi Prefecture, and we visited the town of Tsuwano. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Tsuwano, but Tsuwano has a, a history and a place in Catholic history as a place where there were a number of martyrs, and they were the last people martyred under the uh, Bakfu before the restoration, you know, the Meiji restoration. And they were actually, some of them killed after the pronouncement had been made that we're not doing this anymore, you know, <laughs> because it, the word didn't get down there and implemented at their level. Uh, so they had some martyrs down there, and I visited Suwano Catholic Church. And when we went to Suwano Catholic Church, you know, uh, I met this guy, Father Horvath. Now this is great, this guy's great, because my friend and I, we go in and we sit in the church a little bit, looks like nobody's here, and then we hear some sounds outside, and we go around the back of the church, and there's this big man. I mean, he's big, and he's bald, and he's wearing this sort of robe, and he's got a huge double-bladed ax in his hand, and he's chopping wood, you know? <laughs> and he didn't notice us for a moment, but then he noticed it. He comes over and he's holding the axe, you know, and he walks up to us. He says, hello, I am Father Horvath of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Still got the axe, you know, it's like, yes, sir, you are. <laughs> but he turned out to be the nicest guy. 
He was really a great guy. He had been in Japan, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years. Who knows? He was pretty old, but he was really in good shape. Serving, you know, as a Catholic priest. And he had been in Suwano a long time. And he was chopping wood for the bath because it was a wood-heated uh, water heater, a uh, wood-fired water heater. But his hospitality was so great. He said, oh, you got to take a bath. And he made his food. And we actually slept here on the tatami in the church. And he told us that... He says, you have to get up early and leave, uh, put away your things. You, you can stay, but put away your things before the nuns come in for the morning mass because they might not understand. <laughs> 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 Don't want to cause confusion. But he was really this great guy. And that was sort of the beginning of sort of a healing in my heart uh, about the Catholic Church, but about religion also in general because he's just such an amazing man of God, you know. This guy loved the Lord. He had served his whole life in Japan. He loved Japan. He loved Japanese culture. He seemed to know everything about Japan and, and religions and things. Just a great guy. Uh, he passed away a, a number of years ago, but I believe he's buried uh, down in Kyushu, I think, not in Yamaguchi Prefecture. Uh, but he gave his whole life you know, here, and that really impressed me. At the time, I was just amazed that somebody would do that. Well, I went back to the States, and then after a while, uh, I met this beautiful young blonde gal back here, Karen, and uh, we got married and stuff. My first marriage hadn't worked out, but we got custody of my son and things. And uh, we were stationed in Southern California. I was still in the Marines there at a place called Camp Pendleton. And the Marine Corps, being like they are, they station you someplace, but they keep sending you on trips, right? Well, I would go on trips, and my wife, who was raised in a Lutheran church but wasn't serious about that, she started going to church sometime when I was gone on one of my uh, Uncle Sam government-sponsored camping trips in the desert, right? Well, one time I was sent on a trip in 1987 to Egypt, and we spent six weeks camping in South Egypt, which was like the hottest part of Egypt in this barren desert area, conducting exercises, and we had aircraft and things flying. And it was a, a very interesting experience, but not a very easy experience, camping in that desert. They had huge mosquitoes, and that was the only living thing out there besides us, was huge mosquitoes. I literally got up early one morning and walked around looking for something alive. If you've been to the desert, most deserts, you can find all kinds of living things. You turn over a rock, you find some insects, you look at a cactus, oh, here's a cactus, it's alive, you know. But this desert is like nothing, not a shred, not a plant, not an insect. But every evening, these huge mosquitoes would come on the wind when the wind turned. Well, it was that sort of place. But we got a day or two to go up to Cairo and see the museums and see the pyramids. So I visited the Giza pyramids. And I went down inside the main pyramid where you go down and down this stone corridor. I don't know if anybody's been there. And you get to the bottom, and at the bottom, you know, they got this stone thing where the pharaoh was originally, they think, and they give you a talk about the history of 4,500 years ago, how this place was built. And it was one of the first times in my life that I experienced a place that I just felt this oppression of evil. And all I could think about, you know, the history and the, the pyramids are amazing, but all I could think about is how many people died building this thing so that this pharaoh could have this giant monument to his ego after he's already dead and to his religious beliefs and his ideas you know that he was going to somehow have a, a better afterlife because this huge pyramid was built over him and i was thinking this whole thing is just so evil and of course if there's evil then there has to be good because that's the contrast to understand what's good you see what evil and Evil's bad, so here's good. And if there's a source of evil, then there has to be a source of good, which takes you back to God very quickly. So I began to really reflect on that and stuff, and that was part of my journey of faith, was the recognition not of just sad things and painful things in life, but there's actually some real evil out there. You know, and of course, I, being a Marine, knew something uh, about you know the problems of the world. But somehow this was different because it was focused on this one place in a series of events. Well, I went back and a year later or so, about a year later, uh, 
at Calvary Chapel of Oceanside, I gave my life to Jesus and I got baptized at Easter in 1988. And my wife had made a decision uh, somewhat before me, almost a year before me or so. So that really began our true Christian life. And um, the, the strength of that church was really, you know, just really teaching through the Bible so that you really begin to understand about Jesus and understand both the history of what happened and what God was doing and things. And there's just always more to learn. But I really came to a faith and a commitment to Christ there and began to grow in my faith. And we were at different churches after that because the Marine Corps keeps moving you around. But after I eventually got to where I had 20 years in the Marines, you know, I put in and I got my retirement uh, in 1996 and we came to Japan as missionaries. And we served at this little church, Hiroshima, Fukushima, Tokyo, Kai. Uh, with Pastor Nagashima and his wife. Wonderful, wonderful godly people. The tiny little church there is actually a, a Kyodan church for people who know Japan United Church. And uh, we were there six and a half years. And it was a really blessed period, but it was also a period of really expanding my understanding of what the church was because Pastor Nagashima saw a lot of very different things in the Bible than what I had learned before. And a lot of what he saw I could agree with very quickly when he pointed it out to me and things because he read it from a, a Japanese cultural uh, viewpoint and from a whole different way of looking at the scriptures. And I learned so much from him. He really was a blessing, you know, and we had the privilege of serving there. And then we came up to Osaka, though, finally in 2002, and we were going to start a new church. And uh, we worked on that, but that didn't actually uh, continue. But then I was asked to be pastor at Osaka International Church because they didn't have a pastor. So I served there as the pastor at OIC from 2002 to 2014. And uh, you can see uh, Karen and I there. And if you look over there somewhere is uh, Amy. There's Amy, right? Because Joseph and Amy came and Joseph was my assistant pastor at OIC and then associate pastor for the last couple of years before he started this church here. And that was a blessed period because now I had the responsible, you know, of doing the messages and teaching through word. And you, you learn more when you're teaching than you do when you're sitting and listening. You know, it sticks with you a lot more when you actually have to teach on. Of course, now we're here at Abide and we're helping Joseph and Amy with this church. And the spiritual journey, you know, the journey of faith, it just continues. You learn more and more and you see more of what God is doing and the things. And you, also, if you look, you can get a deeper understanding of what's going on with many of these other faiths. Uh, and appreciate what's good about them and at the same time see what maybe isn't good. And every church also has its own problems. You know, no church is perfect. There's an old joke that says, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go there, you'll ruin it, right? Because <laughs> we're fallible human beings, and the only way a church could be perfect is it doesn't have any of us fallible human beings. I guess it's assembly of angels or something, you know, because that's not the way people are. People have problems, and uh, we make mistakes. So what have I learned in this uh, journey? There's still so much I don't know, but I've learned some things. And I just picked out a few Bible verses to share to say something about the things I've learned along the way. And here's one. We have a maker. Uh, God created us. And Nehemiah 9, 6 puts it very well. It says, uh, Nehemiah speaking to God. He says, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all their starry hosts. But the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And the, you give life to everything and the multitudes of heaven worship you. I'm going to read that one more time because it's so important to, to get the flavor and the idea of God as creator. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. So God created everything, and the multitudes of heaven, the angels, whatever beings there may be, they all worship the Lord God, the creator. And that's what we're supposed to do, too, because we're also part of God's creation. He gives us life. He sustains us. He blesses us. He sends the rain for our crops, and we should learn to worship him. Uh, and we have a purpose in this life. You know, Micah 6, 8 says, He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, to act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
Now that last part, walk humbly with your God, it's about having a fellowship, a relationship with the Creator God. You know, that to walk together with someone is to, to have sort of a friendship, a relationship, a fellowship. And we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to have a relationship with uh, God the Father who created us in all things. But there's a problem, you see, because our hearts are not pure. We are sinful, you know. Proverbs 29 asks, who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Well, maybe somebody says that, but it can't really be true, because we all, as human beings, uh, we say things we should not say, we do things we should not do, and then when we ought to say something, we stay silent or say the wrong thing, and then when we ought to do something, sometimes we pretend we don't notice and we do nothing to help that person who's in trouble or something. And we really, we all fall short in various ways of God's standard of holiness. So we're not clean and we're not pure, but God has shown us a way. God speaks to us. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And that's Hebrews chapter one, the beginning of it. But in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. God speaks in various ways. He speaks through nature. He speaks through the Bible. He speaks through people we meet. Maybe he even speaks sometimes through these other religions because God can do that because he's God. But all of this leads us to his son that he's speaking of through Jesus Christ and also who is his heir and through whom he made the universe because Jesus is not just the son of God he's also with God and God it tells us in John 1 you know and that takes us into the area of this whole trinity God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit but only one God we don't need to get into that today but it all works because Jesus is God come to us God with us and Jesus is Lord. Jesus, uh, he's talking to these people back, and it says in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to, to get to Father God, you need the introduction through the Son. We have to go through Jesus. And when we come to Jesus and we ask him to help us, he, says, he makes us new. He makes us a new creation. It says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Yeah. And then the way it works is because, of course, God is in Christ. Christ has God come to us. And it says, Jesus is Lord. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. So when we learn about the cross and the resurrection and stuff. The key to understand is to realize that God is in Christ. Jesus is actually creator God come in human flesh to us. Because otherwise the cross doesn't really make sense in a way. You know, it's like if you think of it as here's God and he sends somebody else to die on the cross for us, that kind of gets weird. But if you think here's God and his son comes, then God is in his son because his son is also God come in human flesh. Do you realize that God is giving himself for us? He's showing his love to us by giving himself as a sacrifice to restore our relationship with him. And then it suddenly begins to make sense that God loves us so much that he gives himself in the person of his son for us. And Jesus invites us. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. So the invitation is for everyone to come to Jesus and to have that restored relationship with the Father. Now, all of us have our own spiritual journey. We all have our own journey of faith. And I don't know where you are on that journey or how you got to the place you're at. I know a little bit about some of you and your background, but a lot I don't know as well. But I just want you to consider what Jesus is saying and the, you know, consider the things I'm saying that I've learned along the way. Uh, you don't just have to take my word for it or anything, but take it as a starting point to learn about Jesus. And maybe you'll find that as I found that he is Lord and he is God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for the honor and the privilege 
of uh, sharing a little bit about how you've worked in my life and my journey. And I just pray, Lord, that your grace would abound to everybody who's uh, here and who sees this later on the internet or whatever, that your grace and your blessing would be given to each and every one. And we just pray that you would open all of our hearts and minds to see and to understand and help me to, as I continue day by day, to draw closer to you, to learn more about the truth and uh, your plans for our lives as people. Help us to learn how to be truly complete human beings, to have that uh, abundant life that you promised in your word. Thank you, Jesus. In his name I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen.